This is the podcast where inspiring leaders share their stories to empower you, unlock your potential, and create a winning mindset for your future. My name is Luke Murphy, the UK Entrepreneur of the Year. And my co host is Thought Leader Kim Adele. Welcome to Global Futurists. Hello and welcome uh, to Global Futurists. My name is Luke Murphitt. And I'm Kim Adele. Hi. And we have a wonderful guest and VIP today. Her name is Adrienne, or Adrienne Carter. Hi, welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hi, lovely to see you, Adrian. Uh, Adrian Carter is uh, known as the, the Faith Whisperer, and uh, Kim Adele, maybe you can tell us some more. Absolutely. So um, Adrian has got the most fascinating um, back journey, and I know you're going to enjoy hearing it as much as I do every time I meet her. Uh, so she's been instrumental in developing cutting edge research methodologies to gain insight into both emotion, emotion and behaviour for over 20 years, using techniques to go beyond what people say or can't verbalise to get to know what they really feel or really know. And um, she's used it to help brands, marketeers, HR and others to uncover cover the truth. Having worked for global brands such as Coca-Cola, L'Oreal, Disney, Unilever, the Samaritans, she delivers guest lectures on consumer psychology and has seen her work in over 20 different countries. And I know every time that we meet, I could just talk to you all day. So I'm going to ask you if you could perhaps please share with us um, a little bit about your journey so far. OK, thank you. So um, when my children were little, over 20 years ago now, um, I wanted to go into a job that wasn't the normal 95. It didn't didn't sit well with me to do that. So someone said, why don't you go to market research? I've never even heard of market research sort of 23, 24 years ago. Um, did a bit of investigating. I thought, oh, this might actually suit me because I trained as a qualitative interviewer and ended up working as a freelancer. So I could pick and choose when I wanted to work, which suited me down to the ground with the children. You know, school holidays, I could not work if I didn't want to. Um, but what it did for me is it brought me into contact with lots of different people, so many interesting people. I thought this is actually where I belonged. I, I loved working with the variety and got to meet so many interesting people that I would never normally have come into contact with in a, in a nine to five job, probably. So <clears throat> that led me into research. Um, after about 10 years, people get saying to me, you ought to get a proper career now. The children are getting a bit older, get a proper career. So I trained as a counsellor and psychotherapist. Um, during that training, I've never actually worked as a counsellor and psychotherapist. I am fully trained. Um, but during that training, I was introduced to someone who's got a small market research business. Um, and I've got some ideas about how we could make market research better. You know, helping people to really open up with the counselling skills that I've now got. I had ways and means of helping people to say how they really felt and what they really meant rather than the normal boring answer of I don't know or just picking an answer out of the air. So we tried that and grew the company from four people to 20 people um, and worked globally with the global brands that you mentioned in the introduction, Kim Adele. Um, and it's been fascinating. During that time, I sort of developed my skills in understanding people. And one of the things I came across was the face and how to understand how people really feel um, and, and what they show on their face, facial expressions. So 10 years ago, I went to America and studied at the University of California with Dr. Erica Rosenberg and studied the anatomy of the face and the muscle movement and how those 43 muscles in the face can make over 16 and a half thousand different facial expressions. <laughs> of those 16 and a half thousand, three and a half thousand are directly linked to emotion. So what that means is sometimes we show more emotionally on our face than we actually say, because in the English language, we use about 100 words to describe how we feel about something in day-to-day -day life. So sometimes the face says a whole lot more than the words we actually say. So that's been the, the last 10 years. Five years ago, I left my very well-paid, secure job um, as general manager of a global research company to start my own business. Um, ended up doing research for the next few years after that, which wasn't the plan at all. And then two years ago, I decided, right, this is it. No more market research. I really want to, to do something different. Um, and although I, I do do the odd project still for some of my clients, 
it is very much the odd project. Um, I'm now working as a consultant. Um, I do a little bit of work sort of um, consulting when people want to train their staff. So I do workshops, I do keynote speeches, but also I go in with clients to some of their meetings and sit in their meetings as maybe a facilitator or a note taker, but actually I'm reading what the body language is. Uh, somebody said to me the other day, is that, is that allowed? I was like, it's a skill I have. I can read people facially. I, I know what they really mean. What's illegal about it? I'm not, I'm not lying or deception. It, it's about reading people to get to what they really mean, to help my client make better decisions. There's a, this is where we all sit here trying to pull the right face, <laughs> look the right <laughs> way to make sure. <laughs> yeah, this is um, a bit where everybody hides from me normally. Yeah, like, sit there like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, that's that's interesting. Uh, uh, as we as we're talking about just now, obviously, I mean, I, I from a personal point of view, with Parkinson's, find that it affects my face and the way I can express myself, um, and just depends on how how awake or tired I am or different times of day or whatever, you know, so I can be a bit sort of my face doesn't express the way I'm feeling. And it can be quite awkward if people can't read you. Uh, yeah. uh, if they think, you know, if they, if they're relying on certain, certain normal sort of uh, throwbacks to give them communicate and they can't yeah. use those. I think we all, um, a lot of us, not you obviously Luke, but a lot of us take the face for granted and the information that we gain from other people's faces. And one of my jobs I feel is to do is to make people pay, pay more attention um, to the, because if we just become more aware, I know when Kim and I have chatted, you just become more aware of the faces around you. And that that's my job really, because we've all got this skill naturally and inherently, most people have got it, that they can read other people's faces if you know if possible. But, but we don't always pay attention. And I think that's one of the biggest things I would say to people is just pay more attention. You'll be surprised at what you see. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, when we had our first in detail chat about it, it's been fascinating. The the amount you just get into just wanting to be able to like look at everything, don't you? And, and we were saying earlier, you know, the current challenge of people having to work remotely in that, it's a great way of being able to check in on how somebody's really feeling when you're on a Zoom call or something to just see if they might need a little bit of extra help and support. Um, yeah. In these times, the face has become so much more important because it's all we've got. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and and that's why I think uh, Zoom has become so uh, uh, so dominant in the last few days, weeks compared to phone calls, mm. uh, because um, you really do have that extra opportunity to communicate, not just yeah. through face and to, uh, not just through voice, and obviously volumes of voice and tones, but also you can read the body language as well to a degree, and at least. Um, um, try and get a sense of you know if they're if they're looking away and talking to them perhaps they're not so interested or something I don't know well I tell you just quickly before we go into all the serious stuff uh, why don't you give us a few little uh, a few little um, visuals which are which mean certain things just a few take homes that we can okay so well, there are seven universal facial expressions of which yeah. there are anger fear disgust contempt surprise happiness and sadness now I always say to people if they say you know Give me a, a hint and a tip about what should I be looking for. Yeah. For me, the key ones to look for are whether someone is genuinely happy or it's a posed or fake smile. So this would be a posed smile. I'll take my glasses so you can see. A posed smile would be this. So okay. The top half of the face. A genuine smile is this where all my eyes are included. And if, if you the person you're talking to is not showing you a genuine smile, they're being polite. And they don't really, really like what you're talking about so i would what i would say to that at that point is you know is there anything else you'd like me to talk about is there anything else you'd like to know is there anything more i can give you to work with this make it better for you because you've understood that they aren't fully totally engaged so mm. i think that's a really key one to look out for um uh, the other one is fear so a lot of people do this when they're feeling anxious or nervous okay like their lips so that often happens when price if someone can't afford it you'll often see that that happen yep. um so there, there's a couple do you want any more or is that uh, well uh, also what about uh there's a couple of um when, when you know someone's lying they, they look down to the left or the right is it um so that's something from nlp now i have studied nlp now there's a lot of research that says that there's no base in that now oh. what my personal opinion is after analyzing thousands and thousands of people is there is something about the way people look, they definitely look to different areas of the break of the you know when they move the head. But yeah. as for a definitive sign that someone's lying, 
I don't think that's the case. Normally, I, I, when someone is telling something, saying something they don't fully believe, one of the things, this is not a definitive, but it is one of the signs that I would look for, is they do this. You might just see a quick flick of this when they say something they don't fully believe. So that, that's the closest I would go to, to say that someone is, is not telling the full truth. Does that mean that? Does that mean a rabbit is never telling the truth? Yeah, absolutely. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just can't trust those rabbits. No, no, especially Roger Rabbit and all that lot. Um, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll get a few more little ones like that in a minute. Um, okay. Good. Well, so I guess uh, a question for me to you would be uh, sort of what, what um, hurdles have, have you faced, excuse the pun, and how have you overcome them? So one of the biggest hurdles, when I left my well-paying job and started my own business, my plan was to do everything to do with the face and just see where it took me. And I got sucked back into research because I was well-known. Um, I did a good job for my clients. So I, I found that a real hurdle, actually, to, because it was paid, it was well-paid. And, and actually going to the area I wanted to go into, was I was starting from scratch with a... With a um, subject matter that not everybody gets and not everybody gets how important it is so that was a real hurdle for me and for three years I, I felt the frustration I paid well but felt the frustration of actually this isn't what I left to do mm. but the money, the money was there so I had to make a really hard decision sort of two years ago that this is I'm starting from scratch this is a brand new sort of industry and a way of life for me and not just to take the money. So at the, at the start of uh, the year, two years ago, I turned down a, a 100 grand project, but I'd, I'd made the decision that no more. If I want to change where I'm going with my career and my life, I have to start saying no to the money. Um, so that, that was a big hurdle to me. Um, and it, I'm still not as well paid as I was, you know, doing the market research, but it's getting there now. But it takes time. And that, that's the thing, it, it takes time and you have if, to have patience and, and keep going with it. Sure. If that company needs my email address, just let me let them know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, I made a wrong decision. <laughs> yeah, Luke Murphy on LinkedIn will do. Um, okay, cool. What about uh, yourself, Kim Dell? Uh, so I was just going to say, it's a, you know, it's, it is hard, isn't it, when you when you decide you're going to give something up. And, and I, did, I did similar, so I... Um, left my well-paid job and set up on my own and then immediately panicked and took an interim role because you were like oh well it's money and it's it's coming in and it's it's hard to take that leap of faith isn't it but if somebody once said to me you know you unless you unless you jump you won't know if your parachute's going to open um but if you don't jump you're guaranteed it won't well, that's which right. I kind of quite quite liked um so having obviously you you took the leap and your parachute is opening which is which is fantastic um when you look back over your journey to where you are now is there anything that you would have done differently um probably made the decision to go out on my own doing what I'm doing now because I absolutely love what I do now I, I wish I'd done it sooner but hindsight's a wonderful thing isn't it um and I think the fear of not having money coming in uh, it, it's, it's just a fear you know, if you're good yeah. at what you do and you know your onions, which I do, yeah. work will come. So it's that fear that hold, it certainly held me back. And I know when I've spoke to other people, the fear of the unknown is 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 just, it's a shocker for holding people back. And it, it is just a fear that you, that might not be real. And in my case, it certainly hasn't been real. Well, they say fear only exists in the in the brain, doesn't it? Because you've, you've got had to make it up. It hasn't happened yet, but it can feel so real that actually you just you just can't move forward sometimes, can you? And yet once you do, once you push yourself, you then go, well, why did I do this before? I don't know. Yeah. Tony Robbins says, feel the fear and do it anyway. And, and yeah. you know, that that is it. it it's there. I mean, yes, I acknowledge you fear. You're there and you're there for a good reason. But actually, let's just do it anyway. And that, that's something I try and live by now. It's like, okay, this really frightens me, but I'm going to have a go. Let's have a go. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. It's a great, great way to live, isn't it? Like, what is, and I guess that is the thing I, I do similar, which is, you know, what's the worst that can happen and can I live with that? And as long as the answer is yes, yeah. What, what have you got to lose? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, another one for myself would be sort of like, um, what, are, what are some of the lessons that you've learned over the, over the time that you've been uh, a professional? Yeah. Uh, 
throughout your career really and especially obviously in the last last couple of years as well um that I, I worry i used to worry not so much now but i used to worry about other people were thinking well i don't know what other people are thinking and and, and some of that mind talk i think um holds us back because we don't know and you know i've i've had occasions where i've had to pick up the phone to speak to somebody and i really want to work with them and i know they want to work with me but the, my mind talk has been oh they'll be busy they'll be far too busy to talk to me pick up the phone they're like, oh i was waiting for you to call and you're like oh see all that rubbish in my head so that's one of the things the last few years i've been really quite passionate about is sort of um working with my own emotions and understanding yeah. you know how they impact me but helping other people to understand their emotions because emotions are there and they're really important but it's it's an understanding when they serve us and when they don't serve us and they're holding us back so that's that's something i think that's really important that i've learned over the last few years no, that is that is great advice because I think that is one of that is one of life's challenges, isn't it? I mean, we love a label, um, yeah. and dependent on the label that we use depends often on how we then show up in the world. It's like you know, if we said right now we're either safe at home or stuck at home. It's only one word difference, but it has such an impact on how yeah. you're going to feel, dependent on which one of those you choose, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's about framing, you know. When I do the consumer psychology stuff. Um, it's about how you frame things and, it, and and that applies to ourselves how do we frame things you know we frame things for our clients we frame things for our family we frame everything we do in our life but how do we frame <clears throat> excuse me how do we frame what's going on in our own heads and i think that's really important as a business owner yeah no that is that's probably one of the critical skills isn't it because particularly in times like this where you know we are facing the unknown all of us because nobody knows you know nobody's been in this situation before so so actually learning how we frame for ourselves is, is probably one of the most critical skills is there any top tips that you've found that work for you or for your clients that help them in that reframing um, so one of the things is is this fear, and it's one of the things I've noticed a lot in the last sort of two months. There's a lot of fear abounding, and, and and fear is all about out of control, feeling out of control. So the top tips I've been saying to, to the people I've been working with, you know, what is it that makes you feel more in control of your daily life? Is it setting your alarm so you get up at a certain time? Is it taking your lunch break and going for a walk? What makes you feel in control of your surroundings? Because that, once you feel back in control, the fear dissipates and then you've got more, more bandwidth in your mind to concentrate on what you need to be doing. Maybe it's for your business or for your personal life, whatever it is. Sometimes the fear can be overwhelming. And I, I've certainly noticed that, you know, you see it on social media. People's posts are overwhelming with fear. And I just think, you know, it's not serving you very well. Fear does serve people very well. You're in a dangerous situation. You need that fear to you know keep you safe but in in the situation we've been in at the moment it might not be serving people as well so um and the other tips is, is is notice more about other people be aware of what they're saying how they're saying it and what their face and body language is telling you because people can be struggling and they don't always like to say because they think oh you've got enough on your plate i don't need to add my problems to your problems and actually mm. sometimes just a conversation is is absolutely enough you know I, I did volunteer work for Samaritans for five years and they've been a client as well but, but just talking to people and letting them really speak without judgment without putting any meaning on it you know just say how you feel and that's so empowering because people do feel better just by having a chat so I, I would say you know if someone goes quiet in your circle work or personal life they go quiet I want to be known why they're going quiet if it's if it's not their normal behaviour. And with faces, you know, that's the one thing people say to me, oh, you're reading me all the time. I'm not actually reading people all the time. The, the time I notice is when people's behaviour changes. If they're normally a chatty person and they go quiet, OK, something's changed, what's going on? If they're normally really expressive with their hands and they stop being expressive with their hands, what's going on? And that, that for me is the most interesting bit. Is it's not noticing all the time what's happening. It's about when people's behaviour changes. That's when I'm interested. Fascinating. Yeah. Hey, you, you, you must find uh, that uh, when you're watching TV and you're seeing like politicians speak and um, leaders, um, you must be reading sometimes what they're saying and how they're answering and thinking, you don't mean that, or um, yeah, he's genuine, or 
yeah. whatever um can you give us a few examples of those which perhaps we can um so the latest one dominic cummings um i did some analysis of his statement and um he, he the read out prepared statement flowed almost all the way through until he gets to the part where he talks about going for the walk and if you watch that again from about nine and a half minutes to 11 11 and a half yep. minutes the flow even though it's a pre-prepared read out statement completely changes so again this is what i just said to you it's when people's behavior changes he doesn't feel comfortable about that bit that's the bit he knows is on the most shaky ground and in it even though it's prepared and read out the body language the facial expressions still leak you know what's going on so i was asked by itv this morning to analyze boris johnson's statement you know he came back after suffering from coronavirus yep. only um, said you know, use the word love and that didn't they yeah and, and what they didn't actually use the clip because there was nothing negative to say really about it and they, they want people want negative news they're looking to catch people out oh. there, was nothing, there was nothing to catch him out really um you know he came across as genuine I think he'd been coached in how to put the statement across, but he came across as genuine and we all bought into that and it was authentic. The reason why Dominic Cummings and Prince Andrew's statement as well mm. failed so badly is because they didn't come across as genuine because maybe they weren't genuine. You know, when we are feeling something and, it, and we are giving a statement, it should flow, it should be easy, like the conversation we're having now. It's easy. When it, we're not comfortable, or we feel stressed about some of the details, or we're not telling the entire truth, it doesn't flow. Mm. I find an interesting one um, to be Tony Blair, for example. He was uh, quite quite an amazing sort of uh, orator, wasn't he? Um, mm. You know, that's what really made him, I think. And he, he, if it wasn't natural, he made it natural, and he, he made these power moves, and, you know, where he throws uh, words across and everything else. And, um, you know, uh, I, I used to find that very interesting watching him. Yeah. And another one, like him or loathe him, it would be Donald Trump. He seems to have quite a control over what he does. Um, some people don't like that, but obviously that's how he's got to where he is, by the fact that he's in full control of him and people around him, even from the fact that he squeezes people's hands tight yeah. you know, as a battle thing, um, or he doesn't let go, or um, he, he, uh, I've noticed he makes, when he shakes people's hands, he holds his hand closer to him so that the person reaches out. So it looks like yeah. they're sort of, you know, he, he's in control. He's got there. Right yes, absolutely. And one of the things he does a lot as well is, if you, you'll find clips of this on YouTube, he does this. So when he, uh, there's a great clip of him on meeting um, Putin, President Putin. And yeah. just before they start talking, Trump does this. And people do that when they, are sort of sending a message to the person and to the other people who are watching. We yeah. know what we're talking about, don't we? we you know, we we we're all right. We're all right. We know we know what's really going on, and that's that's something to watch out for. You often see that in power plays. You know, yeah, the person is like, you know, we know what's going on, and it's it's like a it's like letting everybody else know that we're in collusion, we're in cahoots. We know what's really going on, and don't you worry about it. Um, I think that's a great one to look for as well. Yeah. yeah and, and, Sorry, Kimmendale, go for it yourself. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, another one I've, I've often found is um, the politician who lets the other leader go through the door first. That's often a big one, isn't it? I love yeah. watching that. When you see politicians together and uh, it's always a battle to see who's going to force the other person to walk through the door because the first person to walk through the door is submissive to the one who's let them through. Did you see? And, uh, go on. So Boris Johnson and Nicola Sturgeon, I wrote for this one on uh, the Sunday Times, actually. They they picked up on that. So he went to shepherd her through the door when he went up to Scotland to visit her. And he, he yeah. sort of did this. She batted his hand away. And and, and it was a real, like, oh. Now, yeah. I don't think he was doing it to be dominant in that occasion. I think he was doing it to be polite. You know, you go first. He was trying to be humble and meek and all that. She was having none of it. No, it was she batted his hand away. Now, in the press, they said, oh, she was... She was doing that because they wanted more photo calls. I've analysed it in detail. She was batting his hand away. Don't you, don't you shepherd me in. She knew what she was doing. Very mm. clever. Very it clever. Is. Yeah, that's right. And and also um, when when I'm at uh, meetings like networking meetings and things, not so much at the minute, obviously. But uh, you know, I like I like watching people's feet because you can tell a lot about people's feet uh, yeah. to see if they want to be part of the conversation or if they want to get out. You know, obviously if, if they're pointing at you. Or into the group if they're not talking to you then they're, they're part of it but if their feet are pointing outwards that's normally an indication that actually they've had enough they want to move on 
and sometimes yeah. they can't get out. So then you can actually go and free them up by asking them questions, saying, you know, where are you going next or whatever. And then they say, oh, I've got to go to. Da, da. Then they walk yeah. up. Yeah. It is, it's said that the feet are the most truthful part of the body. You're absolutely mm. spot on with that. That the feet will always point where the body wants to go. Yeah, it does help a lot to control yeah. conversation. So go on and give give us a few more a few more tips and a few more uh, observations um, that we can apply as business leaders to judge. Uh, how about to judge um, employees or staff? Okay. Yeah. So um, I do a lot of work with recruitment. So with recruitment companies and people who want to hire. And one of the things that I always say to look out for is the facial expression of contempt. I find it for you, which is um, kind of, <laughs> I can't do it now because I'm trying to do it to order, but it's a one-sided smile. Um, yeah. this, side of the, this side of the face has got the, the movement. This side of the face has got no movement whatsoever. Okay. Now, contempt can mean pride, as in I'm really proud of what I've achieved. But on the whole, when you see it from an employee, they think they're better than you and they think they're better than the job they're doing. Oh, I see. I would never, I say to people, if I see high levels of contempt in an interview for a job, do not hire that person because they don't feel the, they feel they're better than the job. They'll never work out and they won't stay. You know, retention is a big thing in recruitment. You know, we want people to stay for long term, not just two months. High levels of contempt, that person doesn't, will not stay because they're not feeling they're part of the team. You want to see high levels of happiness and interest and engagement, but mm. contempt is an absolute no. Wow. So and and, and, in, and in, in any business negotiation, if one person is showing high levels of contempt, there's a so there's a distance in with that. That's it's a cold. It's a looking down the nose, and and it probably won't be a successful deal because that person is showing that they feel better than what's going mm. on around them. So that's going to be really hard to negotiate with. Yeah, oh, it's very interesting. So, in today's society, now the mask has been introduced. Do you think that's affecting people's communication ability to understand what each other's feeling? Absolutely. You know, I I bumped into a really good friend of mine, business friend, um, at my local supermarket, mm. and I didn't recognise him because he's got he's got a, a mask on, and I'm I'm the queen of reading faces, and you know <laughs> I found it really hard. Yeah, and interesting. I, in the end, I know him really well. I said, "I'm going to have to take your mask down because I can't I can't talk to you like this." It was mm. really hard because I was getting no clues. Unless he did a great big smile, there was nothing else I could see. He got a fringe over his eyes. He's got glasses on and a mask on. And I was like, I actually can't communicate with you like this. <laughs> you, you want to try having this mask? Imagine trying to read someone's... Like that. that was a bit like the mask he had, actually. <laughs> yeah. That's to be, I was going to say, to be fair with you... Um, with us not being able to go to hairdressers as well. Everyone's got so much more hair, haven't they? Yeah. So I think, um, that, that also um, covers quite a lot of our faces, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, I've done some profiling of people's faces. And I said to somebody the other way, the client, and I said, send me some pictures. And they sent me pictures with sunglasses on. And like, <laughs> is it... hello. I know, <laughs> that's right. Can't read your face when you've got sunglasses. I was like, can you imagine sunglasses and a mask? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm incapacitated. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I noticed whenever you're giving us examples, you take your glasses off, which does yeah. indicate that actually it's harder to read someone's face with the glasses on or with glasses. You can read with people's glasses on, but I, I'm just trying to make it as easy as possible. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, because, you know, they are a barrier. Not a big barrier, but they are a barrier. Or, or if they've got a lot of hair in front of the face, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I keep doing this as well. Keep them, I take my glasses off so you can see my full face. Yeah. Then you get the full import of what I'm trying to put over to you. So mm. sunglasses, a mask, lots of hair. <laughs> 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 it's a great tip if we don't want to, we don't want you to find out what we're thinking. <laughs> and, a, and a big round nose and some paint in your face, and you might be in the circus. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, good. Well, listen, it's been lovely um, talking to you, Kim Adele. What, what what key key points would you get out of uh, today's? Podcast? Oh my gosh, um, so many as always, um, Adrian. I think some great tips around looking to see if people are genuinely happy or if the if the smile perhaps isn't getting all the way to their eyes and also um, whether or not there's fear or confusion because that allows us to, to step in and right now we've got a lot of confusion and a lot of fear so being able to to look out for that I think as well about being really present so what I got from from what you were saying was it was about making sure that when you're in those conversations with people 
that you are really, really present and listening, not just to what they're saying, but what they're not saying. So looking out for any bits of their behaviour that's changed when um, I always have a phrase that when your lips and hips don't match. So what I'm saying and what I'm doing don't quite mirror. That probably is an opportunity for us to go and just ask a few more questions and seek to understand people. Because I think from from what you were you know what you were saying and the work that you did with with the Samaritans and things, people we're social animals. We all want to be understood. And actually, when we feel a lack of understanding, that can really cause us to to uh, be fearful and feel disconnected. And I think. You know, that's a great opportunity for us to really dig in there and, and try and, I guess, be more understanding and more present. Uh, but I could literally chat to you all day. Um, it's it's always fascinating. Absolutely. And, and Adrienne, have you got any final point, final thought for yourself that you'd like to get across to people? Um, so my big thing is pay more attention. Yeah. Just become aware of what people, information are giving you and what the information you give out as well. <clears throat> we're all giving out information all the time we are communicating even when we're just sat here we're communicating something so be aware of what you're giving out but also be aware of what other people are giving to you um because that way we we get better communications and i, I think if we just become aware of other people we get rid of so many miscommunications which causes problems that is awesome and is there any uh, anywhere we can find you on YouTube or anything like that where people can see sort of the things that you've done? Uh, what, yeah. Where would we find you? So I've got a YouTube channel, which is Adrienne Carter, um, the face whisperer. Um, my website is adriannecarter.com and I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. My business page is Adrian Carter Limited and Instagram, Adrian Carter. So wherever you see my name, put my name in, I'll, I'll pop up somewhere. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll get them into the, into the notes of the podcast and Apple podcasts and, um, Thank YouTube you. as well. We'll get them all across there. Um, well, it's been an absolute pleasure, isn't it? And, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, thank you so much for your time. And um, I'm sure people will, will reach out to you on, on LinkedIn and things. And uh, uh, we look forward to obviously seeing more of you on YouTube and things. And uh, Kim and Dale, th thank you. And we've all done. It's been fascinating, hasn't it? Yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a fascinating um, chat. Uh, I always learn so much. And no, we'll, I will now be going and paying even more attention in, uh, in Zoom calls for the rest of the day. But thank you. It's been a delight. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, thank you so much, everybody, um, for listening, for watching. Uh, do tell as many people as you can. Share uh, on, on, on your, your LinkedIn and things. And uh, we, until next week, we ask you to have a great week and stay safe. This is Luke Murphy, Kim Adell, Adrian Carter on a uh, global futurist. Thank you. We are on a mission to reach the world and inspire millions. We invite you to join us in three simple ways. Like the show and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave five stars on the Apple podcast. Share this on social media. We look forward to you joining us next week. Welcome to Global Futurists.